two, three. This is the word of God. Because I honor his word, his blessings will chase me down and overtake me. I will be in the right place at the right time. I am surrounded by God's favor. I declare that he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. All right, we're looking in the book of Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43. When you find that, I want you to shout praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43. It is on the screen for your convenience, but we always encourage you to bring your Bible with you, whether it's on a smart device or it is a, the book, all right? I, I like the book myself, but uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, we are in the age of technology. And I understand that. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43, the Bible says, You have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Isn't that a powerful word? <laughs> I bet you were so excited coming to service thinking, I'm going to get a fresh word from God, and then God tells us we've got to hate our enemies. I mean, we've got to love our enemies, uh, right? And so uh, <laughs> um, I, want to, I want to encourage us today because we are in this <laughs> celebration of love month, and uh, we're talking about love, and uh, today God is going to challenge us to love our enemies. Look at your neighbor and tell them, what the what? reason I got that confused because last Wednesday, I mean last Sunday, I'm still confused. Last Sunday, uh, Jesus said to hate our parents. And if you were here, you know what we were talking about. Hate our parents, hate those that, you know, our brothers, sisters and such. And then now he's telling us to love our enemies. What the what? Look at someone else and tell them, what the what? What a, this, is, this is not meant to confuse us today. This is just the reason that God is going to help us and, and <laughs> help us to be who he was. I get tickled sometimes. All right, take your neighbor by the hand as a point of contact and a sign of unity, and let's ask God's blessings. Father, we love you. We're so thankful for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful service that you've given to us, this beautiful congregation who are very spiritual, very educated, um, just people, Lord, that love you, Father, come from all different walks of life. We're so thankful, Lord, today for this privilege to be behind this sacred desk and to always minister your infallible word. Let your word go forth in power and demonstration of your spirit, a powerful seed planted in good ground to bring forth much fruit. And Holy Spirit, we know that you're in this room. We have recognized your presence since we walked in today. We know that you're with us. We ask you, Holy Spirit, bring all things back to remembrance, whatsoever has been spoken, whatsoever has been written. Give us insight for our eyesight. Open our ears that we may hear what you are saying to the church. And then we leave this place, we know that we've been in your presence. We know that we have the authority and the power to produce much fruit and to operate in your gifts. And so, Father, confirm your word with signs and wonders. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody says... Amen and amen. Before you're seated, shake three hands, three people's hands. <laughs> Hopefully no one's there that has three hands. Uh, we, we'll pray for you if you do. But shake some, shake some hands and, and tell them, Jesus made me pretty. Jesus made me pretty. Jesus made me pretty. Amen. Well, uh, we begin this celebration of love series. This is uh, such a timely message. I, I, I debated what to minister on and to the direction we needed to go, and the Holy Spirit nudged me in this topic of love. Next Sunday, we're going to be talking about, uh, about fear. There's no fear in love, and we're going to be speaking on that next Sunday morning, Lord willing. But the, I guess what we've started with this, the foundation of this particular series, the celebration of love, what the what, we are, we're, we're, uh, we're building upon this thought. And the thought is this, it is a real cost of following Christ. It is a real cost of following Christ. I don't know if we have gathered a lot of, or understood the gravity of that statement. Possibly because we live in a culture today, a culture, a nation, a society, where church has become lukewarm. God bless the one of you that said amen. 
We are in a culture that is very lukewarm. Jesus identified that even when in the book of Revelations, and he talks about the church of Laodicea. Some of you probably knew this. Laodicea was in the area of Colossia, and uh, if you'd ever read Colossians, you'll, you'll see what the Apostle Paul was telling uh, the Colossians. And uh, Colossia was a, was a village that had, had no water anywhere around. There was no source of water around, and so what they had to do, they had to depend upon the hot springs and areas in that, in that, uh, uh, around that village, around that area, and they had to literally pump water from those hot springs. Some of them were miles away. And by the time they got the water from those hot springs, it became lukewarm. Laodicea was a church, uh, one of the seven churches in the book of Revelations that Jesus talks about, a lukewarm church. And I think the reason that we as believers don't grasp the gravity of this thought there's a real cost in following Christ because some of us perhaps have not paid anything. We perhaps not have paid our dues. But some of you have paid your dues and you know for a fact it is a real cost in following Christ. Our missionary was here at the beginning of this, um, of, of this month and showed a few videos and, and that video from Iraq when he was there, I, I, was, I was scheduled to go with him to that and I told him, I said, I just don't think it, it's, it's God's timing for me to go with you. And he told me that, uh, you know, when you saw the video and you saw the pastor, we've been saying this, the pastor was going around and he was showing how ISIS had came in and destroyed the, the churches. And they were even dug up the graves of the people, that their, their loved ones that were buried there. And they were just destroying all this stuff. And uh, that is a real cost in, in following Christ to the point where people have been killed or uh, martyred because of their belief in Jesus. I think the reason that we are lukewarm is because we have not really paid enough, have we? And so... There is a real cost in following Christ. Whether we know that or not today, there is a real cost. If you are in a leadership position and you lead people in, the, in, the, in an organization like the church, the body of Christ, you know that you are under attack from the enemy because the enemy has marked you as a leader. And he does not want you to lead. He does not want you to, you to influence other people for the cause of Jesus Christ. So he attacks you. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter that, he, that the enemy, the, our adversary, is like a lion who is just roaming around. He is looking for the right time, the right moment to attack you, to, to tear you up, to devour you is what the Bible says. But he tells us that we need to be sober. We need to be awake because the enemy at any moment will attack you. So there should not, there shouldn't be any reason that we're surprised today if we are under attack from the devil, because the devil hates you. Jesus said, "The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy." His strategy this today is to destroy your life. And so I don't know if we are, are if we really understand what it means to truly follow Christ until. We have paid a price. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, paying a price. Some of your children have went astray. And it's because you've kept your, your life in line with God. And because you've, you've done what you know, you know what to do, the devil said, you know what? Treat them like Job. I'm going to come in and I'm going to attack. Well, I may not be able to, to uh, shake their foundation, but I'm going to steal their children. I'm going to try to rob them. And I'm going to try to deceive them and pull them away from you. And that, that, I'm going to tell you, as a parent, that would be a very difficult thing to go through. But let me tell you something. That God tells us, in his, and Jesus tells in this word. He says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. That word church not only means in the Greek, iglesia, but it also means this. The family of God. And if you will continue to pray, continue to be faithful to God, I am declaring and, and agreeing with you that your lost children will come back to Jesus. So there's a lot of work that has to be done. It's just part of the cost of following him. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting this morning that 
because you're a Christian, because you follow Jesus, that that is going to happen to you. But I want, I just use that as a hypothetical uh, uh, a reason because, see, uh, I don't think we are, are there yet. And God is trying to wake us up so we can get there. Amen? And so we talked about that. We revealed that the common thread of Jesus' ministry when he was on the earth is sacrifice. Is sacrifice. That's, I know, I know we want to hear other things about what Jesus did. He laid hands on the blind. They, they received their sight. Uh, you know, he was in prison and he told John the Baptist, he told his cousin, hey, he said, go tell him that, you know, dead are being raised, the blind are receiving their sight, the lame are walking, the deaf ears are opening, you know, and we don't want to hear anything about the sacrifice part of it. But that is a dynamic that we need to talk about. And that is the common thread of Jesus' earthly ministry. In fact, he says in Luke 14 and 33, he says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsakes not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Disciple, that term, you think, well, it's just preachers are disciples. No. A disciple is a disciplined follower of Christ. Whether they're a preacher, a praise and worship leader, or just someone who warms the pew every Sunday morning. They are a disciplined follower of Christ. And so we learn, I come up with these things, I thought they were really helpful. If you're following along in your bulletin, we came up with three expressions of an eternal concept in following Jesus, and here they are. Number one, following Christ is more about preparation than separation. And sometimes we, we are so, the reason I don't think we're sacrificing or we're totally committed to God is because we're afraid we're going to lose something. What does it profit a man if he gained the whole world yet lose his own soul? So it's not so much about separation as it is preparation. Because the Christian life is a lifestyle of preparing to live with Christ in eternity. That is all we're working on right here. We are trying to be, we're preparing to live in that place that he said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I go you may be also, right? So it's preparation. If you think about this this a uh, theme of everlasting life. Everlasting life is what life longs for. Life longs for to live. The resiliency of a person is a lot stronger than you can imagine. I am I'm a young minister. Well, let me say that I'm young. <laughs> I've been ministering for a long time, but I have seen so many uh Loved ones, people that I have pastored, and I call them loved ones, people that I have pastored, and I've stood beside their the hospital bed when they were making that trans, uh, you know, transformation when they were being translated from the natural uh, fleshly body, and they were headed to their eternity, their home in heaven, and so I, I've watched I've watched people die as a pastor. You, you, you're everywhere. Your sleeves are rolled up and you are with people everywhere all the time. And there is a fight that goes on. There is, whether if they're induced uh, in some type of uh, medicine or not, the human body is resilient. It will fight to live. It will, it will fight for its last breath. It's resilient. And so it, everlasting life is what life longs for. It wants to live forever. And thank God for Jesus who's given us this everlasting life. Number two in this, in this concept, a, an expression of following Christ. Following Christ, number two, is more about believing than leaving. And one reason believers have problems with letting go is because they don't believe. They truly don't believe. It's, it's, it's amazing, even on all levels, but one of the levels that's easy to talk about is finances. And some people just won't pay their tithes because they don't think they're going to have enough money to pay their bills. Really? And so you open up Malachi 3 and you say, you do that, you are a thief. You are stealing from God. And so, I, God bless the two of you that, that shouted me down just now. But see, that's what I'm talking about. It's a problem in believing God. 
I love it when businesses will take it upon themselves. I mean, the individuals will pay their tithes, and God bless that. That's awesome. That's a scriptural. But I love it when people who are own business owners, and they will take their tithe even off their business, and they would pay, <laughs> pay it, and God blesses their business. I always said, and I'm not big into politics. I, I follow it. But I always thought, you know, we, it, they, the big news this week is that um, – the United States has now reached $22 trillion of debt, $22 trillion of debt, and that is a place, of course, we've never been before. And though there's always the narrative that, all oh, it's going to hurt our grandchildren, it's going to hurt you know, our great-grandchildren, 22. I always thought, what if the United States government paid their tithes? Do you think that we would be in $22 trillion of debt? No. You say, where would your tithes go to? I'll tell you where you'd send them. Nah, some of you said, yeah, Gospel Lighthouse Church. <laughs> what is 10% of 22 trillion? Someone. No, I think we should send them to Israel because that is God's nation. What if we did that? Can you imagine what kind of nation we would be? We wouldn't be in debt $22 trillion. Well, that's a different story, and I didn't mean to go off on that tangent. Number three is this following Christ is more about vision than division. These are same things that we talked about. Anything with two visions has a propensity to become. Division. Hello. So we took, in part, we took this, we took this hypothetical examination of our faith, and uh, we asked, uh, would we be able to deny Christ or what, and and or watch a family member die? What would we do in that in that hypothetical situation? And uh, it really was. I could tell upon your faces, you're thinking, "Wow." I don't know if I could do that or not. I don't, and some of you say, hey, I'm going to do it. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to deny Christ. I'm going to live for Christ no matter what. And it's easy to say that right now. But the way this nation is headed or where this nation is headed, we may not have the freedom of religion as we know it today. So we said it like this then. We said... We may never be put in a situation where we'd have to choose between Christ and our loved ones, but we do capitulate to the opposite. What we said that in the stress of working and making ends meet, that we are tempted to cut down on church activities, reading the Bible or even praying because we don't have time. Hmm. So what Jesus was saying then, whosoever... He, of you, forsakes not all that he has. He cannot be my disciple. What Jesus is basically saying here is, don't pursue these things at my expense. Nothing, not your job, your wife, your children, your husband, whatever it may be. Nothing is more important than following him and obeying him. That is the bottom line. Jesus is saying you must choose him. So here we are. God created us in his image and his likeness yet he gave us something called the power to choose he, he has given us the will a will to to choose to follow him to serve him to do what we want to do and whatever you know and that's fine i have no problem with that i respect that you have you have the opportunity to choose what you think is best for you okay but this is where in an autonomous society where we, where we butt heads, where the liberals and the conservatives butt heads. And this is, what it, this is what happens. He gives us the power to choose, but the thing is, he did not give us the power over the consequences of our choice. You have, the, you have the freedom to choose, to raise your hands, to worship him, to come to church, to pay your tithes, to do those things. But you have not, you have zero power when it comes to the consequence of your choice. And so if today humanists are telling our young people, if it feels good, then do it. They're not saying anything to them about the consequence, about STDs, about abortion, about the emotional breakdowns, about violence, about rape about all the things that go along with the consequence of sin. Ultimately, the book of James tells us it is death. And so I think today we need to back up and understand that we need to be very cautious 
in our, in our choosing. Galatians 6, verse 7 and 8 says, Be not deceived. <laughs> God is not mocked for whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For they that sows to the flesh shall the flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. So in terms of choosing then, since this is the celebration of love, love is a choice. Love is a choice. And so last Sunday we talked about the four biblical definitions of love. We talked about what they were. We said there was store or storge or storge, however you want to say it. There's phylos, there is eros and agape. And we defined every one of those. We know that agape is the unconditional love. It's a love that Jesus Christ had for us when he went to the cross for us. He had that perfect unconditional love. We know that eros, E-R-O-S, is the romantic love that is based in a covenant, a marriage covenant, uh, romantic love. Then we know phylos, and man, many of you have always believed that phylos meant brotherly love, but in the biblical definition of phylos, the Greek word phylos actually means friendship love. So Philadelphia wouldn't be the city of brotherly love, it would be the city of friendly love. And then the first one was storge or, storge, or storge, and that is the love that we have for our brother and our sister, our relatives, that type of love. And so there's those four definitions of love, and we said this, that love is a choice, but true love, agape love, has no exception clauses. I heard people say, Pastor JC, oh, I love them, but I don't like them. How many has ever said that before? Hello. <laughs> you may not like their attitude, but deep down in your heart, you do love them. All right? You may not like the attitude. You may be in a, a, a little, you know, argument or something, and, but you still love them deep down. You love them. When you look at those four, I find this interesting. In a covenant relationship, a marriage, you have to have all of those. In a true covenant marriage, defined by God, not defined by the Supreme Court, by the way. You have to have all that. Because the Bible says that God is love. And so it has to be, all of those have to be present in a true biblical definition of marriage. Covenant. And so our life point was last Sunday, and our life point this Sunday is the same life point. True love has no exception clauses. And fortunately for us, God's word is the strength to teach us how to love. Look at Matthew 5, verse 43. It says, you have heard that it has been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So when we look at this topic of loving your enemies, this whole thought that Jesus comes, he's a rabbi, so he's teaching rabbis, when they were, when they were children, they memorized the, uh, the entire Torah, the five books of the law. They memorized that in, for, in order for them to even be a, uh, qualify as a candidate to become a rabbi. So they memorized. So Jesus knew the word, all right? The Bible says that he was the word at the beginning anyway, right? And the word, and the, and the word dwelt among us, right? And became flesh. So Jesus is teaching, and now he's teaching something that people who have studied the law, the Torah, the half Torah, which is the minor prophets, those have been studying that, the Pharisees, some of the Sadducees, some of those around, and, and even publicans perhaps have heard some of the sayings. They're scratching their head and they're thinking to themselves, this, this is different. We've not heard this before. This is new. You're telling us that we're to love our enemies? And so loving your enemies may be the most imposing yet splendiferous element of a Christian director, directive ever given to man. Go love your enemies. That must be very imposing to us to love our enemies because it sounds so unreasonable we're to love our enemies. It's absurd that we are to love our enemies. How am I going to love? Think right now. 
someone, perhaps, that falls in the category of your enemy? Do you love them? You say, well, Pastor JC, I don't have any enemies. All right. I have none enemies. It's amazing that maybe today no one is your enemy, but if you plan on living a little longer, you may, you may find some enemies in your life. Sometimes I know, Brother Vernon, the reason there are few enemies in our life is because we don't stand up for what's right. We are very afraid to rock the boat. We are afraid of confrontation. We don't want anybody mad at us. We want to please everybody. But we're going to be given an account for everything we say and don't say. Well, the reason I think it seems that way, the reason it's so unreasonable to us, how could Jesus tell me to go love my enemies? You don't understand. You don't understand what this person has been, been talking bad about me, been talking about my children, been talking about my mom, been talking about my weight, my breath, all this stuff. I mean, posting stuff on social media, on Facebook, saying this and saying that. You don't understand. But Jesus says to love your enemies. And I think the reason we think that's unreasonable I think the reason we think that is so far out, so absurd, is because it is natural for the natural man to avenge himself and plague those who've plagued him. It is, it is part of this fleshly body because of Adam, because of Adam, because of the sin, that sinful lifestyle. Sin that has been plagued into humanity since the beginning, it is natural for us to be hostile toward one another. We are. Don't tell me you're not. I know some of you, you have your angel's wings on today. But the truth is, those angel wings are actually your shoulder blades. And I know some of you today, you're sitting there and you're saying, Look, I got this halo. This halo is just see it on my head. Yeah, but if you if you if you will just take a little closer examination, there are horns holding up that halo. Right? We are naturally hostile to one another. We get offended. It's far too easy. Get cut off in traffic. The father was taking his, his kindergarten to school the other day, and he doesn't ever take his kindergarten to school. And his kindergarten, he's sitting there in the front seat and seat belt on and everything, and he's like, Dad, Dad. He's like, what? He goes, where are all the idiots? And he said, son, where did you learn to talk like that? He said, well, when mom drives, we see idiots all the time here and there. Honk your horn if you love Jesus, right? I think some of you know that one. We're naturally hostile. Get your food made wrong. Uh-oh. I'm in the wrong church. I know. For... But they bring it out. It's cold. You had not even paid for it yet. But you're already complaining. And some of you that went to Guatemala and to Honduras, some of you, you know, just to have food. Is a blessing. Hostile. Hostile toward one another. So I believe then. The only way that we're going to be able to correct this. The only way that we're going to be successful in loving our enemies. Is to have this one thing. Anybody ready for it? Well, God bless the six of you that said you're ready. Anybody ready for this? I mean, we can stay up here as long as we want to. I mean, that's fine. But you guys ready for this? Shout Amen. The, su the successful way to love your enemies is this, is to have the mind of Christ working in you. Nothing else. 
You can go through all the fundamentals of faith. You can take all the classes you want. You can watch every episode of Jensen Franklin. You can watch all and come to church all day long. You can pray. You can do all this. But if you do not have the mind of Christ, you're not thinking like Christ. You come in thinking like Joe, you'll leave out thinking like Joe. I hope nobody's name's Joe in here. Too. But this is what I'm saying. Romans 12, 1 and, and verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. But look at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Renewing your mind. You realize today that renewing our minds in Christ is a daily activity? You just didn't do it like two weeks ago. Or, oh, I renew my mind, Pastor JC, when I came to Christmas. Because when I come to Christmas, you're talking about how Jesus lived and he came as a little baby Jesus. As baby Jesus came to a little nativity and here he is. And so I felt, you know, sorry for baby Jesus because he's out. And, and uh, so I renew my mind then. That's not going to be good enough. Well, I renew my mind when I get to Easter because it talks about Jesus died on the cross. He rose again and, you know, he loves us. And so I remember doing it. You have to do it every day. Someone shout amen. First Corinthians chapter 2, the apostle Paul, he approaches this, this theology about renewing our mind. He says in verse 14, but the natural man receives not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judge all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The only way is to be spiritual. And I'm not talking about being hyper spiritual or super spiritual. Take your cape off. There's no place for Marvel, all right, and the Avengers in Christianity. Okay, but it is an, it's, a, it's, it's so unnatural to love your enemies. That is why the natural man cannot handle the precepts of God. It is unnatural to love your enemies. What it takes, it takes spiritual discernment to love those enemies. It takes the mind of Christ, spiritual discernment. And so before we continue any further, because I know some of you are sitting right now, and you're thinking about your enemies and you've been naming them. Well, it's that hussy down the road. <laughs> or it's that boss when I go into work tomorrow. Or it's so-and-so been gossiping. Or it's the team that I've been playing. Uh-oh. It's amazing how... We get all excited about Jesus here in these four walls in this beautiful sanctuary. And we talk about, oh, yeah, I got I to gotta love my enemies. But when we get out there and we start cheering our children on, playing basketball, football, whatever it may be, it's amazing how quick the other team becomes our enemy and how quick we do not love our enemies. Uh oh Now, I know it's never happened here, but the church down the road, it happens all the time. But so who's our enemies then? Let's define, correctly define who our enemies are. Ephesians 6 and 12 kind of refers, helps us a little bit, leads us. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So he's basically saying to us then, those flesh and blood people that we think are our enemies aren't actually our enemies. It is the wickedness behind it. Spiritually speaking, biblically speaking, our enemies are not flesh and blood. Although the devil gets in flesh and blood. Hello. So the bottom line then is this. The enemy is a force of darkness. It is a force of darkness. This is where I believe a lot of people today are are convoluting this whole topic of racism, 
uh, uh, if, it, if it's in politics, if it's politically correct, if it's not, uh, the whole topic of the abortion, immigration, all of these social issues that we're facing, same-sex marriage, all of these things. I, I see what people are doing. They are fighting flesh and blood when the forces of darkness is who we're fighting. We're sitting in the arena and we're watching this as we would watch someone play a game and we're sitting here and we're rooting on for good, we're rooting on for Christ and then all of a sudden the enemy comes and he begins to deceive us and tell us that the people across the court are the ones that we're struggling with, that they are our enemies when all of the, all of, all of since the beginning of time, the enemy is not flesh and blood in that other side of the court. The enemy is the devil who's been speaking to you all this time. It's time to shut up the enemy. It's time to stand still and see the salvation of God and say enough's enough. I am not listening to the deception and the lies of the devil any longer. Devil, you are a liar. I am not fighting people. I'm not fighting flesh and blood. I'm fighting those wicked forces from the, from the hell itself. And thank God today that Jesus said, I am an overcomer through the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. I don't have to be tormented anymore. I don't have to be pulled into this thought, oh, he doesn't like me, he doesn't shake my hand, or they're against me, and all these whispers from the enemy that's, that's, that is so, it's a misconception from the very beginning that God is trying to teach us, have the mind of Christ. He tells us in, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, for verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And there's some people in this seat right now, that's what you have to do. It's time to pull down some strongholds. The strongholds that are coming against your marriage. The strongholds that are coming against your children. The strongholds that are coming against your finances. The strongholds that are coming against your physical body in forms of disease. The strongholds that are coming against your mind. The strongholds that are coming against relationship. The strongholds that are coming against every aspect and avenue of your life. It's time to cast down those strongholds, uh, casting down imaginations uh, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ and bring it into captivity. Every, what did I say? Bring it into captivity. Every what? Bring it into captivity. Every what? Every thought. Uh, every thought. Uh, every thought uh, to the obedience of Christ. It's time that we renew our mind in Christ. Somebody give the Lord a good hand clap this morning. What the what? Love your enemies. Now, how am I supposed to do that? How am I supposed to love our enemies? That's a great question. It's a very important question. How am I supposed to love my enemy? Let's look at three ways real quick. Number one, well, remember what he said in Matthew 5 and 44, he said, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Number one, let's do this. He said, bless them that curse you. Bless them. Look at your neighbor and tell bless you. See how easy that is? See how easy that is? Bless them that curse you. How do we bless somebody it's cursing us. I worked at a place in Conway, and Conway, Arkansas, and uh, <laughs> had this foreman. Every word that came out of his mouth was a, was a cuss word. And just, oh, rude, and would cuss me left and right, and he could not stand it when I would not react. I just sat there and just smiled. Because I knew that this guy has some issues. He's my, he's my boss, and he's cussing me, but I don't serve the boss. I'm serving Jesus. And it'd get him, he'd get aggravated and aggravated, and I'd just sit there and smile. And then some of my friends, EJ, he'd come up beside me, and we'd just look, and we'd talk about Bible. We'd talk about God's Word. We'd talk about, and we'd draw, draw strength from one another. The devil can't stand that. But how are we going to bless those that's cursing us? 
Are you ready for this? By giving them good words for their bad words. Do you have a good word to give? Hmm? Do you have a good word to give? Because if, you, if you're not carrying some good words within you, it's not going to come out. But if you're sitting there dwelling on all the bad things, guess what's going to come out? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Number two, do good to them that hate you. How do we do good to them that hate us? Are you ready for this? By giving them every proof that you love them. Not just in word and tongue, but deed and truth. By giving, giving them every proof that you love them. Greater love has no man except this, that he lay his life down for his friends. I've been reading this phenomenal book about how to get unstuck. And it's a leadership book. Almost through with it. And in this book, I, I read this story and I thought it was so phenomenal. How there is a paradigm shift. We have said for a long time a shift is coming. And we, we've seen a shift take place. But he began to explain what paradigm actually means. And I'm not going to get into the, all that. But he explained it one way with a story. And that's what I want to share with you. He said a pastor friend of his was uh, in New York City. And he was riding uh, one of the subways there. And if you've been in New York City, you know that subways can go for miles and miles and miles. And sometimes it takes 30, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, even an hour, even longer to get to your destination. And so he's on the subway, and all of a sudden, a father and, and three children get on. And they're on the subway, and this father and these three children, they start getting, you know, restless, the children especially. And they start pushing one another, and they start making noises. And this pastor noticed that the passengers that were around them were getting very uncomfortable because their children were acting, you know, out of place. And, of course, in his mind, he's thinking to himself, well, you know, that father needs to take, take these kids out and whoop them. He needs to straighten these kids out. And the more it happened, the more severe those thoughts became. And he could see it, the expression upon other people's faces and how they were getting really impatient with his father. These kids are just going berserk. They're climbing the rails. They're kicking. They're yelling. They're screaming. And it's getting very, very uh, awkward and uncomfortable. And the father's doing nothing about it. Finally, the father, he looks up at those passengers and that pastor, and he says, I do apologize about my children. He said, their mother just died. They don't know how to handle it. And frankly, I don't know how to handle it either. And those thoughts that that person had, the paradigm immediately shifted to from judgment to I want to help them and care for them. And see, we have to give every proof that we love them. And some of you today, you're like those passengers. You're just judging one another. And they haven't done anything to you. Give them proof. Number three. Actually, 1 John 3, 18, you can put that up there. My little children, love, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. And number three here, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, think about this. How am I supposed to pray for someone who abuses me, who's making continual war upon me, who's constantly harassing me? How am I supposed to pray for someone like that? Well, it's, it's like this. By praying that God alone will change their heart. And by asking God to, to do that which will at once secure their salvation. That God will change their heart. But you know what I found out, Sister Charlotte? That in the midst of that, even in confrontation, God not only wants to change their heart, but he wants to change your heart as well. We're so quick to assume, oh, they got to get their heart right. Why don't we get our heart right first? So I know there's a video that I wanted to show, but we're going to wait on that, Josh. Just don't show that today. 
Our target is that blessing, doing good, and praying for our enemies will ultimately culminate in the peace of God. And that's what the devil cannot stand, Brother Kevin, is the peace of God. Shalom. He cannot stand peace. Jesus said he came to give us peace. Not as the world gives, but as he gives. True peace. He says in Philippians chapter 4, be careful for nothing or be anxious for nothing, but through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let our requests be made known unto God. And a peace of God that passes all understanding will keep our heart and our mind through Christ Jesus. Then he tells us whatsoever things are true, just, honest, pure, lovely, good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, to think on these things. Do you see how important it is for us to renew our minds? My question then this morning is this. Do you love your enemies? Do you love them that talk bad, talk bad about you? Do you love them that hate you? Do you love them that use you, abuse you, whatever you want to, word you want to put there? Do you love them that persecute you? See, true love, our life point, true love has no exception clauses. Whatever the case this morning, I believe that God is creating a way for us to become a patient warrior in the last days. James 1 verse 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. 1 Peter 4 verse 12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in us so much as the part partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Pastor Crystal, can you come to the piano? Sister Linda, can you come help her sing? So how do I apply this to my life? So what now what? I always ask this question. How do I go from auditing, which I've been sitting here listening to this message, how do I go from auditing to actually applying it to my life? How can I make this message? What the what? How can I make it count for life? Remember now, true love has no exception clauses. So I believe that the most efficient way to make true application of this message is to understand what the benefits are in loving our enemies. Surely there has to be some benefits into loving your enemy. There is. Aren't you glad that Jesus showed us these benefits? Because if you'll look at Matthew 5, verse 43, you see where he said, love thy neighbor. He said, it's been said to love thy neighbor and hate thy name. But he says, I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute, persecute you. But if you'll read on, here is the benefits. Verse 45. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Out of context, we as believers always said, well, it rains on the just and the unjust. But do you really think that today, that what, what Christ is trying to tell us is, is about love? He's talking about love there. He's just not talking about your problems. He's talking about love. So what does that mean? Rain on the just and the unjust. What, is, what does this mean here? This is what this means, that God ultimately has the last say. God ultimately has the last say. If you do what God tells you to do, live the way God has asked you to live, God is going to bless you and honor you. But the moment you choose to go out of bounds, it's the moment that you are vulnerable to God, to, to the enemy, and vulnerable to the judgment of God. So I want to stay in bounds. How about you? If he told us to love our enemies, then I'm going to walk in love because true love has no exception clauses. What if we this morning determined I want to love my enemies? I'm going to leave this place in a celebration of love. It's easy to love the lovable, but those that are, I'm having a difficult time with, I'm going to love them the way that God wants me to love. What if we all determined to do that? How would that affect you? How would that affect your family? What will your children be saying about the true love that you're walking in? What will they be saying at your workplace, knowing that you're something different about you? You're walking in true love. 
You know, the gentleman that walked in to the HR meeting and he was going to be let go outside of Chicago, about 40 miles outside of Chicago, brought a, brought a pistol in with a green laser light, he shot all of those human resource. One, one young man, it was his first day to be on the job, shot and killed him. There is a force of darkness out there that wants to cause destruction. But you realize today as a Christian, as a believer, you may be able to get to somebody who is going, who is, who is struggling with so much in their life. You may be able to get to somebody by loving the way that God has asked you to love. Let's stand together this morning. I was praying this week, earlier this week, and the Lord wanted me to have a special prayer time. Now, if you have any need, I know some of you have came up, but there's one thing that, that God said that he wanted me to pray with people for, and that is a spirit of depression. Now, I'm not saying that you're away from God. I'm not saying that you've backslidden. Even the best Christians struggle with depression. I've struggled with it many times. But if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor JC, I want, I want to be prayed for. I'm struggling with depression. There's the, the Spirit's trying to oppress me. I want you to come this morning. I want to pray with you. I'm going to agree with you that God is going to bring you peace like you've never received. Peace that passes all understand. Will you come this morning? Anybody, will you come today? I want you to pray. Will you come? Would it make it easier if everybody's head is bowed and eyes closed? Struggling with depression. Struggling with the feelings of, of overwhelm. Can't lift my head up. I'm hurting. And I want peace. I want peace. I want peace. Felt not motivated. Anybody else today? Anybody else today? Prayer team, will you come and help us? For that.